How many of you enjoyed our family campfire last weekend? You guys enjoy that? So God began to deal with us about gathering together in covenant family relationships and to spend time together around campfires. And I didn't have a, a, a real good understanding of exactly why the Lord was telling us to do this until last Sunday night. And I actually got out there. And I told you, and I don't know if you got it or not, but man, I got it. I had a revelation sitting out there around that fire. And it was, uh, it was, how, what was the temperature? It was, it was probably 80 some 85 degrees or something. And we built a big old fire right out there. And here's what I noticed. I noticed that everybody that came and brought chairs, that, that the circle was pretty far back away from the fire. Wasn't nobody, you know, snuggling up, up next to that fire on Sunday night. Nobody was, was getting all, you know, close and snuggled up to that fire because it was already warm outside. But how many of you realize that when seasons change, that sometimes the temperatures change too? Sometimes in Georgia they change, sometimes they don't. But bless God, they're supposed to, you know, <laughs> they're supposed to change. It gets cooler, right? It gets cooler. And I want to say, if, if we were to have that fire, say, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday of this week, if their forecast is right, I would, I would dare to say that that circle would be a little smaller, wouldn't you? That circle would be a little tighter. It'd be a little more snug. We'd be a little closer together. And what the Lord began to show me is this, is that, you know what? When things get colder out here in the world, the fire in the house of God ought to be getting hotter. And we ought to be drawing closer to that fire. We ought to be coming in closer together. Come on. And here... Listen, look at this. So, so as, as we get closer to the fire, guess what else we get closer to? One another. We draw in closer to one another. What's God been speaking to this house over the last month? He's been talking about being joined. He's been talking about us coming together. He's been talking about us being joined in covenant family relationships together and how it honors God, how our relationship with God is sometimes limited because we've severed ourselves from the body of Christ. And we, we can't live in the, in the fullness of what God has designed for us to live in if we've severed ourselves from his body on the earth. Amen. Our relationship with God is two parts. It is one, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, to come together. And so God is drawing us around campfires, closer to himself and closer to one another. You can't have one without the other, guys. If you want to get more of him, you're going to have to get more of one another, too. If you want more of, more of one another, you're going to get more of him. But we're going to need to come together so that we can experience all that God has for us in this life. Amen. I still believe, like David, that, that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. I'm going to see. I'm already seeing it. It's already here. It's coming and it's here. It's already here, but it's still coming. Jesus, guess what? By his spirit, he's already here, but he's still, he's coming too, right? And so is his goodness. His goodness is already all around us. But his goodness is still more to come. That's so good. You never get to the limit. You never get to the end of it. It just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And it gets sweeter and it gets sweeter and it gets sweeter. And praise God. He's good to us. Amen. So Matthew chapter 13. I want to share just a brief word with you. Matthew chapter 13. Brother Jerry, I, I thank you so much for coming. That was great, man. Thank you so much. Matthew chapter 13, really familiar passage of Scripture, but I want to share with you some things the Lord began to deal with me about even just last night, uh, as recent as last night. So I hadn't had a whole lot of time to dive into this in depth. I, I told you Wednesday night that I feel like this, uh, this message of, of being seated that this is a message that the Lord's going to continue to build on and he's going to continue to draw more out of. Who was here Wednesday? Wave at me. All of our Wednesday night folks. How many of you feel more seated today than you did Wednesday before you came here? All right, a couple of you do. Good. The rest of us, we need to, always, we need to hear this word. Listen, God's desire is that we are seated in devotion with him. We're seated in our relationship with him. What happens is, is that we become, uh, when, when we are uh, given ourselves to, to so many different things. And we talked about the story of Mary and Martha and how, how Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was busy serving and busy cleaning the house and cooking dinner and doing whatever. She's running here and there. And Jesus made this statement to her. He said, Martha, Martha, you are troubled and worried about many things. And that word actually that he used there for worried, it's, it's talking about being scattered or being pulled in so many different directions. But then the Lord revealed this. He said, but really only one thing is needed needed. And Mary has found that better part. 
Have you found the better part? That's really what this is all about. If you come into this house, you should leave here having found the better part. Not more religion, not more go through the motions, not more, hey, listen, I had enough of that. My whole life I grew up in church and doing nothing but repetitive religious ceremony and never once drew near to this seated posture that he's calling us to right now. But God is calling us to be seated in devotional wonder with him where every day is a new adventure in knowing God. It's like getting saved every morning. That's what it is, really. It's getting saved. It's getting born again every day. It's walking in a fresh relationship with God that does not stagnate and it never grows stale because we're ever drawing nearer to Him. Nearness to God. Being seated in, in nearness. That's really what life is all about. You can serve. You can run around. You can do all of the ministry stuff. Listen, I'm, I, we got to have programs and we got to have events and we got to have things going on. We need to have these things. But these things are not really the main thing. The main thing really is knowing Him. It's drawing near to Him. In fact, the reason you were created was not for what you could do, but it was for who you could become in relationship with Him. Right. Knowing Him, walking near to Him. Anybody with me so far? So a little recap. A little recap. So I realized something while I was talking Wednesday night. I kept, I kept saying that, that the Lord wants us to be seated. Seated. How many of you heard me say that? I've said it over and over. I bet I've said it a thousand times in the last two weeks. I bet you I've said be seated a thousand times since we started talking about this message. Be seated, be seated, be seated. And I never heard it like I heard it the very last time I said it Wednesday night. I said be seated. And it was like the word popped up in my head. I could see it spelled out in front of me. And I've been saying be seated, S-E-A-T-E-D, right? Be seated, spelling, right? S-E-A-T-E-D. And it was like, as I said it the very last time Wednesday night, the, the, the letters rearranged and I began to see it spelled like this. S-E-E-D-E-D. -E -E -D. Be seated. The Lord changed it. He flipped it on me. Come on, this is, a, this, this is how God does things. He wants you to be seated while you're seated. Now watch. Watch this. This is pretty interesting stuff. Actually, while you're there in, in Matthew 13, just hang tight for just a second right there. I want to read to you what has quickly become my favorite of the Psalms, and it is the very first one, Psalm 1. It makes it really convenient. The first one's my favorite one. I like all of them that comes thereafter, but the first one is just, it's just my favorite. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree. Somebody say like a tree. Like a tree. He shall be like a tree. Now watch this. Planted by the rivers of water. Planted by the rivers of water. In my Bible right here, I'm looking at it. Do you see? And it's, all, it's up there too. Do you, do you see anything unusual about that word planted? It's capitalized. It's a proper noun. It's not a, it's not a description of, of a condition. It's a name. Do you, you hear what I'm telling you? Come on. That, okay. Listen, focus with me for just a second. It's a name. Planted is a name. Do you, do you get, are you hearing this? you got to get this if you're going to get anything that I have to say to, to you this morning. Planted is a name by the rivers, multiple rivers of water. I'm going to get into it at some point in time. The Lord began to talk to me about these rivers and about the four rivers that are described for us in the garden. And I've mentioned that before, but he began to draw out so much of this. It's going to be really rich. I want you to be here Wednesday night. I want to share that, that word with you if the Lord permits us to. But watch this. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season or every season. The Bible should say there that word in its season means in every season it produces fruit. It brings forth fruit in every season season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. This is the will of God in your life that you would be like a tree planted by his rivers of water that bring forth fruit in every season that your leaf would never wither that you don't have a down season. Come on. Christianity was never meant to have good times and bad times and ups and downs. Now look, we go through stuff, people. We all know that. We go through hard things. We go through difficult times. But the truth is is that that should not affect my relationship with the Lord or with the body of Christ. 
And you know what tends to happen is somebody starts going through something, and number one, they run from the church. They go hide out somewhere. They, they, they're going through something, and they're struggling, and they're dealing with issues at home, or they're dealing with issues at work, or, or deal with issues with their children, whatever, and they, they disappear. And then it's like everybody's going, well, what happened to them? What's going on? They separate themselves, and as they separate themselves, guess what else happens? Their leaves begin to dry up. You ever seen, I know a lot of you saw after the, the hurricane stuff blew through here and we had so many trees down and limbs down and different things. And, and you know, for, for about a day or two, what, those leaves still looked like they were attached to the tree on those branches. They were beautiful, man. We lost a bunch of uh, pecan limbs and they were scattered, uh, you know, scattered about. And, and you could look out there and it just looked like, you know, a healthy looking plant is, is there. But you know something, it's been severed from the source. And by being severed from the source, it doesn't take it very long. In a couple of days, those leaves begin to dry up. They begin to wither. They begin to, 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 to life begins to leave them. Listen, I, I don't believe that that's the will of God for any of us to lose the life that, that, that he wants to flow through us. I believe just like this scripture, his leaf shall not wither. He wants us to be green. He wants us to be fresh. He wants us to be lively. He wants us to have the life of God being emitted from us. Look, I, I'll just be, be real with you. I, 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 think we, I think the church has been grumpy long enough. And the world has seen too many grumpy Christians. And I think the world has seen too many droopy Christians, like the flowers, when you pick them and you cut them and you put them in the vase and for a few days they look great. And then after a little while they start looking kind of sad, don't they? We got some sad looking Christians walking around and yeah, their, their soul is, is, is eternally secure in the hands of the Father, but their here and now is looking pretty pitiful. It's looking pretty sad. Why would anybody want to join up with that club? Come on. I'm just being real with you. Why would anybody want to be a part of something that looks so sad? Really, I don't. Like sometimes I, f I see more life in people that haven't even known life yet. In an outward expression anyway. I, it should be, it's illegal actually. Let me just put it this way. It's illegal for us to have the kind of hope we've got on the inside and to not express it on the outside. It's, it should not even be legal in the body of Christ to have the kind of hope, to have the kind of peace, to have the kind of joy that we've been given, and then on the outside look like we've been sucking on lemons. It's just not going, it's not going to fly anymore in the body of Christ. We've got to, we've got to have something greater on the inside of us that can be expressed on the outside. Remember I told you this last week, the kingdom within you was meant to change the world around you. It was meant to transform the world around you. But instead, many times we allow the world around us to affect the kingdom within us. And so this is, this is a, a revelation for me. This is a name planted. All right, now I want to get back to Matthew 13, and I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. So look at this. On the same day, verse 1, Jesus went out of the house, and guess what he did? He sat down. What we've been talking about, being seated, right? He's going to get into this some more in a minute. And a great multitude were gathered together to him, and he got into a boat, and he sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Guess what? Anytime God, or Jesus in, in, the, in the, the Gospels, most of the time whenever we see Jesus getting ready to do something awesome, guess what he did first? He sat down. He sat down. I, got, I, I told you this Wednesday night, but just a recap for all that were not here. Man, I wish everybody would start coming to church on Wednesday night so I don't have to preach twice on Sundays. I mean, really, we'd get out of here a lot quicker if y'all just come on Wednesdays. But here's the thing. Whenever we look at it, we're going... I mean that. I really do mean that. Y'all don't, I don't think you believe me, but I'm telling try it. Come Wednesday and then see if I preach as long next Sunday. All right? Just check it out. Try it. Try it. But here's the, here's the situation. When, when, we're, when we're not seated, right, and we're up running around trying to fix this and do this and try to get God's favor in this way and that way and try to make this work and that work, and we're trying to, 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 to control everything and, and trying to, to, uh, to make our way. Listen, when we're up running around doing all that stuff, we can't be in a seated posture at the feet of Jesus, and that's the source. That's the place where we get something to give. So ultimately, really everything that we're giving away is just from us unless we found a seated place at the source, right? Everything that we give away has to come from him. Jesus said, I do nothing that I don't see the Father do. What's he saying? I'm seated. I'm seated in devotion with the Father, and that's why I've got something to give away. 
He said, I don't do anything. I don't see the Father. I don't say anything. I don't hear the Father say. Every action of his life was being dictated by his relationship and devotion to his Father. And every time you see Jesus getting ready to do something great, what did he do? He went and he found him a spot and he sat down. And he, in fact, many times we see through the scriptures that Jesus even tried to sneak away during the night to go be alone with his father, to find his seat in preparation for the day, how God was going to use him. Amen? That's a good word. You need to find your seat. But this is about being seated. So let me, let me just keep going here. So verse 3, then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And he sowed, and some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And some fell by stony places where they did not have much earth, and so they immediately sprang up. And because they had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Come on, let's just pray this prayer real quick. Say, Father, give me ears to hear. I want to hear your voice today. If you flip on over, mine is on the, the next page, but it says this on down in verse 37. Jesus is talking here, and listen to what he says. He says, He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's, that's Jesus. Now watch. Verse 38. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Now if we're going to be seeded or planted, as Psalms 1 talks about, being planted by the rivers of water in that place of being able to flourish and being able to, to walk in the blessing that's not affected by the drought around us, we have a well within us, right? We have, an, uh, we have a, a root system that goes deep down into these rivers and supplies everything that we need so the, the temperature outside doesn't cause us to do anything but draw nearer to the, to the one that's inside, right? And so here's what Jesus is trying to tell us here, though. He says the sons, or, or I'm sorry, these seeds that he's talking about are actually the sons of the kingdom. That's you. That's me. That's those that are born again, a part of the family of God. They're seeds that are being sown. So here's your new, your new name. Listen to it because we saw that planted with a capital P. That's a proper noun. That's a name. You're, listen, I think all of us need to begin to see ourselves as a seed. I am a seed. That's my, that's my identity. God has created me as a seed that he sowed into the earth. And what I love about it is he goes on and he tells a story. Uh, he tells another parable in, in verse 44. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. What was the field? The field is the world. And the treasure, listen to what kind of treasure. It says, which a man found and he hid it for joy over it. He goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. He hid it in the earth. Why? Because it's a seed. What do you do with seeds? You plant them. You got to put them in the earth, right? You got to put them in the ground. Jesus said this, and in, in, I believe it was in John, uh, John 12, 24. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls to the ground and it dies, then what does it do? It produces, it bears much fruit, right? Jesus is giving a parable about his life being sown to the earth to produce a harvest of many sons for the kingdom of God. But listen to me, that was not just Jesus' mission. You took place in that mission when he left this earth. You are a seed. Come on, say that. I am a seed. I am a seed. I love, there's a, there's a David Crowder song and he sings, he says, talks about I am a seed. Y'all can look that up sometime. David Crowder's I am a seed. It's kind of a funny song. I am a seed. But what does Jesus do? He's talking about you have to hide the seed. Earlier this year, God was talking to us about being hidden. Come on, that's not popular in the church today. It's all about the spotlight. It's all, about, it's all about how many people know my name, and it's all about how many people think I'm great, and how many people I got following me on Facebook, and how many people I, I, I influence. And, and let's just see how, look, what if, what if Jesus' idea of, of the body of Christ never uh, amounted to what we've called the modern Christianity version that says the more people you have, the more successful you are? In fact, I, I look at the ministry of Jesus, and I'm looking at his ministry going, there's many times that the Bible says that Jesus would say things almost seem like intentionally to weed out the ones that didn't belong there. He wasn't trying to grow a big church. He wasn't trying. You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to get some good seeds into the ground. Because he knew if I can get good seed into the ground, they'll produce a harvest, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. 
that, yeah, there's going to come multiplication, but you know what? First, we've got to make sure we get the right seed in the ground. Multiplication can't come before we get the right seed in the ground. And until this thing gets hit in the ground, God wants you to be seeded. Now, the, 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 the issue with being seeded is, is this. Really, ultimately, it comes down to this. We don't want to die. We don't want to die. I heard somebody say one time that, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I'm a seed. And we know this to be true in this area. Man, there's so much rich agri- agriculture in this area that w- we know that, that, that in order for a seed to produce the life that's within it, that seed has got to die. In order for that seed to die, to be in the place, in the right environment, in the right good soil with all of the right things around it. And, and there's so many different elements to that. And we may get into that at some point. I believe there's more that the Lord's going to begin to reveal to, the, to us about this. But let me just tell you something. That picture is this. It is the death and the burial and the resurrection that we saw, we read about in the Gospels that took place in the body of the Lord Jesus. But it also is meant to take place in the life of every believer. When we baptize with water up here and, and, and we, 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 we talk about this, how it's, it's a process, of, of, it's an outward example of an inward reality that I was dead to my sin. I died in my sin and I, I gave my life to Jesus and I went under that water dead to sin and then come back up again alive with new, Christ, or new life in Christ to walk in newness of life, we say. So this is the picture. This is the, this is the demonstration of the Christian life. But let me tell you, God needs us to be seated. He needs us to get seated. How interesting is that those two words just kind of run together there and how the Lord showed me that. Immediately uh, last night as I sat down to, to look at back over my notes and what the Lord was showing me Wednesday night, I sat down and, and I, I had this, this funny thought come to me and I began to think about my brother and uh, my, my brother Scott, you know, I hear you, I talk about my brother a good bit. He and I are still really close, and uh, we've always just been really good friends. But he's, um, he lives in Louisiana, and, uh, and every time we get together, everybody goes, man, y'all, y'all look alike. Y'all look so similar. Y'all, y'all just have a lot of the same features. And, and it's like, man, yeah, there's no mistake in you two are brothers, you know. And uh, we hear that every, every time we get together somewhere. Everybody thinks that we look just alike. But there's one major difference between me and my brother. And it's on my head. I'm not talking about the beard, because he has one of those too. It's the hair. I have hair, and my brother does not. (laughs) And every time I bring that up, he tries to speak against my hair. And I rebuke it in Jesus' name, and I keep my hair. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong with with those of you that have less, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But I, I, was sitting there, I was sitting there last night. I was looking over this, and I was thinking, why, Lord, why, what are you trying, why, why am I thinking about my brother? And then it hit me, and I saw this, this word, reseed. <laughs> so he wants you to be seeded, and, and here's why you need to be seeded, because there's been some reseeding going on. Hello? <laughs> that's good. You know that's good. You know that had to come from God. You know? That had to be God. <laughs> I hadn't talked to my brother about it yet, but I'm going to, you better believe I'm calling him. There's been some receding going on. We've been, there's been some receding going on. And so here's, here's the problem is we don't, we don't like to admit whenever we need to be reseeded. We need God to reseed us. We need God to reseed us, okay? Now, I want you to get a picture. This is a spiritual thing, but I, I ask you to pray this, and I hope you prayed it, believing God's going to do it, to give you ears to hear, okay? Give you ears to hear. But God wants to reseed you, all right? Now, there's a positive and there's a negative to that. We've been reseeding because of some things that in the natural that we have allowed to catch our focus, that we've allowed to steal our attention, that we've given our affection to, even some idols in our lives that we've given ourselves to. And these things have caused us to recede from the plan of God in our lives. But how many of you know God is a good sower and he can sow the seed again? 
See, here's what happens a lot of times is that people, people, people think, well, man, that was a long time ago. God, you know, I, I, felt, I felt him. And there was a time in my life when I was passionate. I was excited about the things of God. And I was spending time in the Word. And I was, I was, I was, just, uh, I was involved in lots of things at the church. And it was just an exciting time. And, and something must have changed somewhere. It must have been that pastor. He must have quit preaching this, this, you know, the things that I needed to hear. And, 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 and things, they don't have as much going on over there anymore. And, 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 and it must have must be something wrong with the church without ever fully having our eyes open to see that if something's not right here, it's probably because something began to be wrong here. And because I started to recede from the plan of God for my life. Let me ask you, if you, if you find yourself today in that position of saying, I need to be reseated, and maybe, maybe you feel like you're missing some of that zeal, you're missing some of that uh, affection for the Lord and the people of God and that, that feeling of being planted and being secure and in that place of, of knowing you're right in the center of where God wants you to be. If that's your feeling, if that's how you're, you're feeling this today, ask yourself this question, where did I unplug? Where did I let go? Where did I allow myself to be receding? What did I let recede in my life? Was it your quiet time? Was it, was it your, your, uh, your worship time? Was it your personal devotion time? That's probably where it started. Because that's always at the source. That's always the center of really the real issue is not uh, the things you've been watching, the things you've been listening to, the stuff that you've been exposed to in the world. It all starts with an inward receding from God's presence. You know why David got in the mess that he did with Bathsheba? It wasn't because David had, had some sort of uh, self-control problem. It wasn't because David had some sort of perverse spirit on him. You know why David got in the mess he did? Because he receded in the place of devotion. The Bible says that when King David came to his palace, that he says in the season when the, the kings normally go out to war, that King David was at his house. He was resting on the, at his house, and he was on the rooftop of his house, and he began to look out over from the palace over the, the city, and he saw a woman bathing on the rooftop. And this is when the moment happened. Listen, he wasn't falling into sin because of perversion or because of a lack of integrity or because of any, All of those things were out of a, a, an overflow of a life that had had left devotion. David forgot who he was. He forgot that he was a man after God's own heart. He forgot the little boy in the, in the wilderness with the sheep singing songs to Jesus. He forgot those things. He receded in devotion and it led him into a life of compromise. When we recede in devotion, it opens us up to compromise. Come on. Look, we don't like to take responsibility for things. But we got to start taking responsibility for some stuff, guys. Listen, if you're struggling out here, it's because you're struggling in here. Because the bottom line is, is my, my outer world is influenced by my inner world. And if my inner world ain't seated, I'm definitely not going to be seated out here. I might can put on a show for everybody, but eventually it's going to bleed through. What's going on in here is going to show out there. I need to be reseated because I've been reseeding. From him. If you're not as close to God, or if you feel like that in this moment you are in some way backslidden, that's receding. That's what I'm talking about. You say, I'm just not where I ought to be with God. You can't fix that, by the way. It's your responsibility. It's you. I'll, I'll just put it on you. It's your fault. You allowed receding to take place in your life. You, just, you chose to sleep in and not come to church. You chose to not continue to spend time in the Word of God. You chose. I mean, I'm not trying to make this easy. Don't, look, it's not, it's not easy. Dying is hard. It's the hardest and easiest thing you'll ever do at the same time. And those of you that are in that death process right now, you understand exactly why I said it that way. It's the hardest, easiest thing you've ever done. And those of you that don't understand what I'm saying right now, it might be because you're not quite in that death process yet that God wants to bring you into so that he can cause the life he placed within you to come out of you. Yes. A seed has this hard outer shell on it. I started to give everybody a seed this morning. I might do that when we get into this further. A seed has an art, a hard outer shell on it, doesn't it? And, and, but did you know this? That a seed has, has a tiny little opening to allow 
there to be to enter some moisture. That tiny little opening is so important. It's vital. Because you see that hard outer shell and that seed when it goes in the ground and it dies, there is a, a source that is given to that seed that is going to seep into that little bitty of Listen, God always leaves a way to get back into your life. And sometimes you can't see it. I mean, I, I was looking at an apple seed, you know, trying to find where is it at. No, it's there. God leaves a little, a little tiny opening so that the water can get inside. Listen, in your life, you may say, I don't see how he's going to get back through this hard shell. I don't know how he's going to get through this hard stuff that, that the world has turned me into this calloused Christian. But let me tell you something. He's always got a way. He's always got a way. There's always still a way. He's always reserved for himself a way back in your life. That's why you can't look at anybody anywhere and say, they're, they're, nothing's ever going to change with them. That's why you can't write off anybody. I've seen God take, take people that everybody else wrote off, and that's the ones he puts his hand on. He said, nobody else saw that little opening in your life, but God had it. He had it hid. He knew right where it was, and at the right moment, that drop of moisture comes into that seed, and that thing from the inside, what was dead, comes to life. Oh, God, bring us into that place. Was well, the church of Jesus Christ again where that dead thing comes to life. Listen, the only hope for America is revival, and the only way we get to revival is if the church dies. Do you hear that word? The only way we get to revival is if the church dies, if we commit ourselves to the process of the cross. Jesus said, if anyone desire to come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. He's the example. Have you been receding? The answer for your receding lifestyle is the receding of the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants to plant you again. Like a, like a tree. But look, how many of you realize this? That tree didn't start out like a tree. You know what it started out like? A seed. A seed. A little insignificant seed hidden. I've been saying this little motto of mine for the last six years since we've been here in little Elleville. God likes to do big things in small places. In fact, that's biblical. Jesus was born in the smallest of the towns, the least likely place for anybody to come and change the world was Bethlehem. And not only did he choose Bethlehem, but he chose the little barn in Bethlehem that nobody ever would have suspected. He likes to do big things in small places. He, he can do big things with your life if you'll allow him. He can do big things with your life if you'll accept that you're a seed. See, some people have a hard time accepting and acknowledging that there's something small. Like we've become big shots in our own eyes. And we think we're something else. I'll be honest with you, we do. A seed's small. A seed is small. That doesn't mean that we have a, a small mindset about who we are because we know that who we are in Him is not small. But don't, don't, have, don't have this mindset of small like I'm powerless. No, I'm small, but the power's within me. And if I'll allow God to bring me through this process, he'll take what he put in me and he'll bring it out of me for his glory. Some of you are right on the edge of, of, of not just being seated, but being rooted. That's the next step. But you can't get rooted till you get seated. God's will for your life. You're sitting in a chair right now. I told you this Wednesday, and I'm done, but I told you this Wednesday, there's a difference between sitting down and being seated. I, I, I even I showed a, a little demonstration about, about sitting down because what happens is we tend to sit down and then get up again. Being seated means I'm not moving. Being seated means I, it's, not, it's not so much a posture as much as it is a, a, a position. Do you hear, you hear that word? Being seated is not a posture, it's a position. And when you get seated in relationship and you get seated in devotion to Yahweh God, 
That becomes not just your posture, but your position. And in seated with him, he will then cause you to be rooted. There are things that you are gonna, your roots are going to grow down deep into. What did Psalm 1 say? He's planted by the rivers of living water. He's planted by these wonderful rivers. And what are these going to produce in their life? A fruitfulness in every season. Come on, that's the body of Christ, guys. We're meant to be fruitful in every season. There ought to be fruitfulness in every one of our lives in every season. And not only that, but his leaf never withers. And everything you put your hand to will prosper. Because your life now is, is, is not, you're not living unto your own glory, trying to be more than a seed. First, if you accept that you're a seed, you'll understand that it is the glory of God within you that he's trying to bring out of you. And it's never for the glory of us. It's never so that we can make ourselves look big. That tree is going to come from a seed that knows I exist for the glory of God. So where are you at this morning? Baby, will you come up and play for something? Just I want to ask you this question. Are you receding? Have, have you been receding? Some of you dealt with this issue, even whether it was termed this way Wednesday night or not. Some of you dealt with this, just you and the Lord. But I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you've been receding, if you've been separating yourself, if you've been severing yourself from the body of Christ, or if you've been severing yourself from your relationship with God, if you are in any way receding this morning, and I'm not talking about your hairline. We'll pray for that too if you want us to. But if you're receding in your relationship with the Father, listen to me. It's time to allow Him to recede you. Amen. It's, it's, it's really a whole lot simpler than it sounds. The seed really can't do anything in itself. But when the seed yields itself to the sower, the sower sows the seed. Jesus told us in Matthew 13, he said that a man, he found a treasure in a field. I used to think that treasure was like gold, some diamonds, maybe some, some kind of real fancy jewelry. He found it in a field. Somebody lost it. And he, he, he was looking for something, but he found a treasure. I used to think that treasure was some kind of, some kind of shiny thing of some sort. You know what I think he found in the field? A seed. So he took that seed and he planted it in the ground. The Bible says, doesn't ever say he went and dug it up. You know what the Bible says? He, he gave everything that he had. He sold everything that he had and he bought that field because he knew what was coming. Hear the word of the Lord. He knew what was coming in your life, and he gave everything to buy your field. He gave his own life to buy your field because he knew what was coming. You feel that? You hear it? He gave it all for that field because he knew what was hidden in it. It was the life that he designed for you to live. It was that every day of your life was recorded and written in his book before any of them was. He declared the end of a thing from the beginning and he said the end is glorious. Even though it starts small. Even though it seems insignificant and even though nobody else is going to notice it. Nobody else found the treasure in the field because they weren't looking for treasure like that. They weren't looking for little pieces, specks of dirt that nobody else thought was valuable. They weren't looking for, for, for those that have made mistakes and have gone down the wrong road and have from time to time allowed themselves to be a part of things that they didn't allow, need to allow themselves to be a part of. Nobody else was looking for treasure there, but he was. He found a treasure that nobody else wanted. That was me. He found a treasure nobody else thought was treasure, but he said it's treasure. And he took it and he planted it in the ground. And then he gave everything for that whole field. Because that, look, because what he intends to do from that seed, it's going to take a big field. 
It's going to take more than just, just the spot that that seed occupies right now. Come on, that seed's going to grow. And what, small, what starts small, that's why the Bible says don't despise the day of small beginnings. Why? Because God intends to do great things from small places. Big things come from small places. Where are you at today? It's a word. Hear the word of the Lord to you this morning. Guys, if you don't mind, will you bring these lights down? We're just going to worship for just a minute, and I'm going to invite the Father to reseed you. I'm going to invite Holy Spirit to come and reseed you. And you don't even have to have a, 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 a real deep understanding of how that works. I don't. I just know the sower knows good seed, and he puts the seed in the ground where he wants it. But whatever that means in your life, it's time to return back to the sower. It's time to get back in the sower's hand. It's time to quit receding, to quit pulling away, to quit running our own direction and going our own way and to come back to the hand of the sower and say, sow me where you want me to be. I, I commit myself to this dying process. And I, I, whatever it costs, whatever people think about me, no matter what everybody else is talking and saying about me, I'm committing myself to this being reseeded so that you can produce something great out of my life church he's calling us back to the sower's hand will you be seated today every head bowed every eye closed Holy Spirit do this Holy Spirit do this do this Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you a question all across this room. Everybody under the sound of my voice, I want to ask you this question. If you're far from God today and you say, I'm, I'm born again. I gave my life to Jesus and I know that if I died today, I would go to heaven. But right now, I am far from him. And even though I know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, I am not walking in fellowship with the Lord today. I have receded and I'm ready, to have, I'm ready for him to recede me. If that's you, nobody's looking around. This is between you and God right now, but I want to pray for you. So I want you to just wave at me real big. If that's you, I see you. I see you. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anybody else? Nine. Anybody else? Come on, all over this room. Don't miss it. You can put your hand back down. You're here today and you say, I don't even know what it means to be alive. I have yet to surrender my life to Jesus. And this morning, this day, I understand that something is pulling on my heart. Something is drawing me to know God. And I'm tired of living for myself and I'm tired of doing it my own way. And I want to be secure in the hands of the sower and I want His purpose and plan for my life. I'm tired of living for myself. And you want to be saved today. You want to be born again today. I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to, if you, if you know that's you and the Lord's talking to you this morning, don't you wait. Don't you stop and think about it. You know if the Lord's drawing you. I want you to stand up where you are. I want you to come down to this altar. If that's you in this room, you need to be born again today. You want to be saved, get down here. Don't wait. Don't wait. Come on. Don't miss it. Anybody else? Come forward. Come on. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. It's between you and God right now. But you need to take this walk of faith. You need to take this action, this step of faith. Come on down here. Come on. Somebody else. There's, there's somebody else. You're, you're, you're fighting it right now. Come on down here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, those of you that said, I, I, I'm not where I need to be with God right now, but I want to be, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. And it's between you and God. But there is something about saying, I'm going to step out in faith. And if you raised your hand, you said, I want to be close to God today. I want to be nearer to him than ever before. I've slipped away, but I'm coming back. I want to be reseated today. I want you to come right over here to this side of the altar, right over here on this side, on this left side, right over here. Come on. Don't worry about anybody else. It's between you and God right now. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. This is where life change happens. This is how we do this. 
This is how we put ourselves in position for the Holy Spirit to do a work of reseeding us in our lives. Come on down here. Come on. In faith. Holy Spirit. Yes. Do this, do this. Come on, everybody else, let's just worship together for just a minute. I, just, I feel like we need to press into the presence of the Lord here for just a moment. Just take a few moments. Don't, don't worry about anything that's going on up here. You just go after God. You just give yourself and your attention to the Lord right now. Come on, the more I find you. Sit at your feet. I wanna sit at your feet. Come on, sing. Drink from the the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. I wanna feel your heart beat. Feel your heart beat. This love. This This love love is so deep. It's more than I I can. I'm melting your peace It's overwhelming Come on, just worship I want to sit at your feet I want to sit at your feet Come on, you can stand up if you want to Just lift your hands to the Lord Lay back against you and breathe Feel your heart beat This love I melt in your peace Come on church, tell him I want to sit at your feet I want to sit at your feet Drink from Come on, press the in. cup press in. in your hand Lay back against you and breathe Feel your heart beat This love is so deep It's more 